Good afternoon, friends. Uh, we are here today uh, for a very special session on four revolutions in India's future. Now, I think that uh, considering that all of us who are in Delhi have seen really a fifth revolution, which has just happened perhaps, but which we may or may not have reckoned, and maybe Sumit will like to take note of this fifth revolution, which, is, uh, which you have just experienced. But anyway, we are delighted uh, to be able to have this interactive session with Mr. Sumit Ganguly and uh, uh, now to commence the session, can I request uh, Dr. Michael McRobbie, the President of Indiana University, to introduce Professor Sumit Ganguly. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Singh. Uh, it's also a great pleasure. I was introduced before to two other distinguished guests, two former foreign secretaries of India. It's a great honor to meet both of them. And let me also welcome other distinguished guests who are here this afternoon as well. As many of you know, the Aspen Institute has a well-deserved reputation in the United States for fostering leadership and the dispassionate analysis of major issues of social and political concern globally. That it has grown to become a global organization with partners in at least six countries around the world speaks, I think, in large volume to both its relevance and its success across many cultures. It was actually in 1999 that I had the privilege of speaking at an Aspen Institute event in the United States on the future of higher education. So it is with so it is with special pleasure to be here with you this afternoon in New Delhi to introduce one of Indiana University's most distinguished professors. Dr. Sumit Ganguly joined IU's faculty in 2003 and since that time he has held the title of the Rabindranath Tagore Chair in Indian cultures. He also serves as the founding director of the Madhu Sudan and Kiran C. Da Indian Studies program, which is one of only two such programs in the United States solely focused on Indian studies, ancient and modern. His long-time leadership in this area has helped to make Indian studies one of Indiana University's greatest strengths, and we are uh, extremely proud of, of that fact. Dr. Ganguly has held a wide variety of distinguished positions at prestigious institutions around the world, including serving as a distinguished visiting fellow at the Institute for Defence Studies and Analysis here in New Delhi, holding the title of the Nagi and Professor of International Relations at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, serving as a visiting fellow at the Centre for Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law as well as the Center for International Security and Cooperation. Both of these institutions are at Stanford, and he has held a host of other positions as well. In addition, Dr. Ganguly has served on the faculty of the University of Texas at Austin, Hunter College within the City University of New York, Columbia University, and Michigan State University. Dr. Ganguly is a prolific author with at least 30 books and monographs to his credit, including his recent book, India Since 1980, co-authored with uh, Rahul uh, Mukherjee, and I had the pleasure, he gave me a copy of that book um, a few months ago before we left for our present visit to India. I had the pleasure of reading uh, that excellent work, which to those of you who haven't read it, I commend it to all of you as well. In addition, media outlets, both here and uh, in the United States, regularly ask him, or media outlets such as PBS and CNN, regularly ask him and turn to him as an expert analyst on various issues and matters in India. The quality of his research and other professional work have engaged in part by the great support that it has received from organizations like the Asia Foundation, the Observer Research Foundation, the Cooperative Monitoring Center of Sandia National Laboratory, the Kaliki Corporation, 
and the United States Institute of Peace. In addition, Professor Ganguly was awarded the Medal of the Italian Chamber of Deputies in 2006 and more recently received the Pravasi Bharataya Saman Award from the Government of India in 2009. We're very proud and honoured that he is a member of the faculty of Indiana University and it is with great pleasure that I introduce him to you this afternoon so would you please help me welcome Indiana University's uh, Professor of Indian Cultures, Professor Shumit Ganguly. Thank you very much for that extraordinarily kind and generous introduction. Um, and I also wish to thank the Member of Parliament, uh, the Honorable Mr. Singh, uh, for kindly taking time out to chair this session uh, on this hot, sultry afternoon in New Delhi. Uh, it's virtually a ritualistic incantation for every academic. It's virtually like an anthropological ritual whenever he or she gets up to speak before a major audience such as this, to say how much of a pleasure uh, uh, this is to give this lecture. But in this case, it's with a genuine uh, and heartfelt sense of pleasure that I give this lecture because of the very reasons that President McRobby outlined about the significance of the Aspen Institute and now its presence for the past several years uh, with the chapter here in New Delhi. Um, I'm also quite touched that several very senior individuals whom I have had the pleasure of knowing and working with over an extended period of time have chosen to grace this occasion. And I only hope that over the next 20 minutes or so uh, that I will be able to rise to the task uh, that is before me. Uh, without any further ado, let me turn to the substance of my talk. There are essentially four components to it. Uh, really five components to it. There are four revolutions that I intend to talk about. The first is the transformation of India's foreign policy at the end of the Cold War. The second is the transformation of India's economy since about 1991. Some people would argue somewhat earlier, but I prefer the fiscal crisis of 1991 and the changes that occurred thereafter um, as my starting point. The third and I'm going to borrow here from the work of a very close friend of mine who is probably France's leading authority on contemporary Indian politics, uh, Christophe Jaffrelo, and Christophe's notion of the silent revolution that is underway in India, namely the uh, mobilization of India's poor and India's socially uh, disadvantaged and marginalized, and how this is going to trans is transforming India's democracy. So I'll talk about uh, that kind of social and political mobilization and the consequences that I see for India's democracy, in large part positive, but with some potential downfalls. Fourth and finally, I'm going to deal with a rather somber question and a particularly fraught question. And it is perhaps fitting that after talking about things that are mostly uplifting and mostly positive, the trajectories of which are mostly positive. It's important to also have a sobering discussion about this, even though there is no imminent threat. The threat, I thought, was much greater when I was writing this book, but India and Indian politics has a remarkable way of thwarting what scholars write and confounding us, uh, which makes that all the, all the more interesting. And that is the very question of the future of Indian secularism. And finally, fifth, I will talk about very briefly how, why I deem the, these four issues to be so critical and indeed revolutionary in terms of propelling India into the 21st century. So these, this then constitutes the ambit of my talk. Let me start then with the first theme that I wanted to uh, uh, deal with, namely the transformation of India's foreign policy. Given the talent that exists in this room, 
um, I feel somewhat humbled talking about Indian foreign policy because I'm merely an observer of Indian foreign policy. I'm merely an analyst. There are individuals in this room who actually brought about the transformation that I'm going to talk about. So I'm merely a kind of am an amanuensis to these individuals and little more. Uh, these are individuals who actually made the critical decisions. But without any further ado, let me plunge into that subject. What, what I mean by the transformation of Indian foreign policy is the remarkable dexterity that India's policymakers demonstrated at the end of the Cold War. The adroitness with which they abandoned long-held beliefs and long-held commitments and managed to readjust India's foreign policy to a vastly different world order that had emerged at the end of the Cold War. One of the constants of Indian foreign policy from the early 70s onwards, as the vast majority of you in this room are well aware, was India's strategic partnership with the Soviet Union. And as one individual in this room who will go unnamed, uh, but used a marvelous uh, cosmic analogy to uh, talk about the end of the Soviet Union and the impact on India, and this individual told me in an interview once, uh, and I won't mention where because that might give away the identity, um, that it was the equivalent of the disappearance of a supernova. Uh, that is the impact it had on India. But the uh, astonishing thing was how quickly India managed to adapt to that reality. Instead of clinging on, thinking that somehow or other a very anemic Russia might somehow manage to quickly resurrect itself and continue the, to play the role that it had played, in terms of guaranteeing India's security against the possibilities of a recalcitrant China. The Indian policymakers very quickly moved with remarkable skill to improve relations with the United States, to improve relations then with Southeast Asia, to improve relations with, uh, to put relations with Western Europe on a much firmer footing, um, and, uh, and also uh, to uh, normalize the relationship with Israel, which had always been kept at an arm's length, at least in the public domain. All of this uh, required an extraordinary sort of fleetness of foot to be able to adapt to the vastly changed configuration of power in the global order. And also, while I understand that this is not an uncontested notion in New Delhi. India also dropped a lot of its rhetorical flourish about transforming the global order and instead focused much more in a fairly direct fashion on the furtherance of its own material and national interests. Instead of trying to be the exemplar of the third world, and insisting on sort of the transformation of the global order, India uh, in increasingly adopted a much more pragmatic foreign policy, much more designed to further its own particular interests. And quite frankly, there is nothing unreasonable about that. The ideational world order that India had pursued in many ways after a period of time and I recognize I'm going out on a limb here with some people, but so be it. One must stand by one's views, um, even if they are unpopular. That ideational foreign policy that India had pursued, particularly under Jawaharlal Nehru, which had act actually uh, 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 contributed to significant benefits to India, but then after a period of time, I think, the benefits had started to dissipate, and India was known more for rhetorical flourishes than being able to make any material difference in the global order. And by dispensing with that ideational uh, set of concerns and instead focusing much more on the furtherance of India's own material interests in the world order and adopting a much more pragmatic stance, I think the country benefited considerably. I can elaborate on some of the, on this scaffolding, sort of uh, flesh out this skeleton during the uh, uh, interactive session, but at this point, in the interests of covering the other three 
uh, transformations or revolutionary transformations. I think I'm going to leave it at, uh, and let it rest uh, over here. We can talk about specific issues and specific decisions and choices in considerable detail during uh, the exchange. Second, the transformation of India's economic strategy was even more revolutionary. For all the problems that continues to besiege India's policymakers, and they are frankly legion, there are gross disparities. India uh, is actually faced with the danger if it does not uh, respond um, to this challenge. Uh, there have been already people sounding the toxin about the possibility of crony capitalism emerging in India. I don't think there is an inevitability about it, but I think it is important to sound that toxin, especially in light of the scandals that have besieged the Indian economy in the recent past. Um, there are increasing disparities of wealth and income, uh, depending on how one measures, depending on the, which committee report one relies upon. There is the whole issue of the number of Indians still trapped below the poverty line. These are all very real sandbagging, effect, uh, sandbagging uh, issues confronting the Indian economy. But that said, it's vitally important for us to recognize also, and forthrightly, and which I do in the book, is that this is a vastly different India from the license permit quota Raj, to use Raj Krishna's inimitable phrase. This is a completely different India. There are entrepreneurial energies that have been unleashed. Uh, Indian uh, uh, firms uh, are performing uh, uh, in a fashion that was almost hardly imaginable during the first 30, 40 odd years of India's um, um, uh, economic performance. Indian firms are increasingly ab uh, abroad. They have carved out particular niches from pharmaceuticals to informatics where they are actually uh, challenging the dominance of many other historically much more powerful firms. Uh, and in many ways, this even challenges conventional economic history. Uh, Alexander Gershenkron, one of the greatest economic historians, once argued in a very important book called Economic, Back uh, His uh, economic Backwardness and Historical Perspective, that certain niches in the global economy were captured by certain countries that had industrialized early. And it would be exceedingly difficult, if not well nigh impossible, for others to enter those arenas. Well, India has demonstrated that the Gershenkronian th thesis does not hold in every area. And one can think of pharmaceuticals, one can think of uh, informatics, obviously, and even now in certain forms of high-end manufacturing. So the notion that this Gershenkronian principle was a kind of an iron law is no longer true because you can build this kind of capacity. Now, these might be niche capacities, but nevertheless, it has happened. And also, coming from the United States, where President Obama is now promising 1.5% economic growth in the next quarter, um, which is deemed to be an achievement. And here in New Delhi, one hears great lament and sort of sackcloth and ashes because the Indian economy grew at a mere 7.7%. Now, I recognize fully that a mature economy cannot be expected to grow at 7.7%. But 7.7% for most economies, mature or otherwise, um, uh, is actually quite a respectable rate of growth. However, when one has already seen 9.8%, I suppose it is a coming down in life. So, the point I'm trying to make over here is that there is indeed a revolution that has taken place. And if one looks at poverty figures, there is little question if one uses the same basket of goods, if one doesn't change the, the, uh, the fig, the, how, the in, how the index is constructed, there has been a significant decline in poverty since the embrace of economic liberalization. It may have contributed to greater inequality, and that usually happens based upon the historical experience of other countries. But there is no question that a significant dent has been made because of high rates 
of economic growth. I am not one who believes purely in the cult of growth. I do believe in what the Prime Minister refers to as inclusive growth. But without growth, as the noted Indian economist uh, uh, Jagdish Bhagwati has repeatedly underscored, that without growth, you cannot make a significant dent in poverty reduction. It is simply humanly impossible. And this is a point where, where, which, uh, on which I would obviously defer to someone of his intellectual stature and grasp of uh, questions of economic growth. And speaking of growth, India certainly has long dispensed with, which again, to find another inestimable expression from the late Raj Krishna, from the Hindu rate of growth where India grew between 2 and 3% annually with population growth about at 1.5% to 2% with the effective rate of growth being about a percent or percent and a half. This was not a strategy designed to make a significant and permanent dent on rural and urban poverty. So whatever be the problems of inequity, and that is a problem, that is a serious problem that cannot be swept aside and cannot be swept under a carpet. Nevertheless, without this emphasis on growth and without a continuing uh, uh, opening up of the Indian economy, promoting competition, promoting innovation, the, with uh, India's ability to lift significant segments of its population from the curse of grinding poverty simply will not come about. So, indeed, one has witnessed a revolution, and it's a revolution not only in material terms, but also in ideational terms, in that we have seen the steady acceptance of the notion of the market as an important phenomenon for generating growth and for sustaining growth. One can debate the extent to which the market should be regulated, the, to the extent to which the market uh, should be subjected to various forms of surveillance, but there is a much greater acceptance of the importance of pursuing market-friendly policies and not to dismiss them as uh, sort of extraordinarily sort of fragile strategies for economic growth which could come crumbling down like a house of cards. Uh, at, at this, uh, 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 when faced with any kind of an exogenous or endogenous shock. I think there is a much greater faith in the utility and the viability of the market as an engine of growth and even an engine eventually of poverty reduction. So consequently, not only in material terms, which, is, which are very visible, but also in terms of uh, abandoning <coughs> what William Blake, the great English poet, once called a set of mind-forged manacles, that those mind-forged manacles have finally been broken, and that there is the possibility of embracing a new set of ideas uh, about how one promotes growth and uh, brings about a reduction of poverty. Let me turn now to the third issue that I wanted to talk about, namely what Jack Rollo calls India's silent revolution. There is little question that a second revolution is taking place within India. The first revolution took place, and the great Indian sociologist M. N. Srinivas wrote an important book about this called Living Through a Revolution, when he talked about the rise of lower castes in southern India. And that took place in the 1960s. There was a fundamental transformation of the social order and what is remarkable is that this was done primarily through the ballot box, not through violence. There were sporadic incidents of violence, obviously, but this was a non-violent social revolution, ushered in largely by social activism and the ballot box. What we are witnessing now in northern India is a repetition of that revolution with the rise of lower castes, with the mobilization of lower castes and the growing political consciousness of lower castes and their, the reflection thereof in state legislatures and also in the national legislature. Will this process be perfectly smooth, perfectly uh, uh, happy, perfectly felicitous? Obviously not. It is going to be a difficult process because 
Those who have wielded political and economic power obviously are not going to simply stand aside and say, yes, it's your turn now to enter the arena, to enter the fray. No. This is going to be a subject of considerable contestation. Indian politics will remain volatile as a consequence of this. Will lower castes always make sagacious judgments? No, most certainly not. Will they always elect the most statesmanlike individuals? No. As one knows from the experience of certain Indian states, you have populist leaders who are more interested in sort of the edifice complex, to coin a term, uh, rather than alleviating the lot of the people who ele elected them in the first place. Electing, e erecting enormous statues to Dr. Ambedkar might uh, uh, provide a degree of, uh, uh, of cultural and uh, sectarian uh, pride, but it's really not going to put more school teachers in the distant parts of Uttar Pradesh. So, obviously, while I celebrate this re revolution and the rise of lower castes, I also recognize that this is not going to be a perfect linear process, all leading us happily to the end of the millennium. By no means. Social change is never that happy and felicitous, especially when you're trying to accomplish it through the ballot box. But is this now realizing the promise of Indian democracy? Democracy does not guarantee you outcomes. Democracy only guarantees you a certain process. And all we are witnessing now is what some of my Indian colleagues call a social churning. And that's uh, precisely what's happening. The kind of democracy that existed in India in the early part of the Republic was a democracy largely based upon the quiescence of a significant segment of the population. That segment of the population now is not going to be quiescent. But will they always sort of support institutions, norms, and the like that one has long cherished and which constitute sort of the key features of a democracy? No. They will violate certain existing norms. They will undermine institutions or seek to undermine institutions. There is going to be considerable jostling within this limited political space that exists, an attempt to expand the scope of the political arena. All of this is going to be a turbulent process. But at the end of the day, it is going to produce a much more representative democracy a democracy that is actually genuinely inclusive and provides opportunities to individuals regardless of the social station or the social order they happen to hail from. And this, in many ways, Jaffrelo quite correctly characterizes as India's silent revolution because this is not a revolution that is cacophonous, that involves throwing bombs, that involves storming the Bastille. Instead, it is a revolution that's largely taking place through the mechanism of the ballot box. But it is going to be turbulent, as all revolutions are. There is no escaping it. But at the end of the day, it is my firm belief that it is going to produce a democracy that is genuinely representative of the complexity and the variety and the diversity of India's social order. Which finally brings me to my only sobering and somber question, and that is the future of secularism in India. I'm the first one to clearly and forthrightly recognize that the Jeff Jeffersonian wall of separation, which is increasingly looking pockmarked, by the way, in the United States, uh, because of the rise of certain religious entities and individuals and the shameless pandering of certain groups and individuals to the lowest common denominator imaginable. And in many ways it brings to mind the work of a great American historian, Richard Hofstadter, who talked about the existence of a streak of anti-intellectualism in American life. I am now urging my students to dust off their copies of Hofstadter and read him because that's the only way to understand the kind of mindless uh, attacks that are taking place on the secular edifice of the United States. But this lecture is not about the United States. I digress. I should return to India. India 
has already faced multiple challenges to secularism. And, and at one point, I must confess that I was one of the Cassandras of the, uh, suggesting the imminent demise of Indian secularism, especially after uh, certain developments uh, took place, which we are all familiar with uh, within this room. I don't think those dangers are as imminent as they were in the late 1980s and in the 1990s. I think India has indeed turned a corner, and I think the, uh, the rise of uh, a kind of virulent Hindu nationalism which one witnessed is actually now receding. I don't think the danger is nearly um, uh, uh, as uh, cogent as it was in the 1990s. Why do I nevertheless resurrect this issue? I resurrect this issue principally because Indian citizenry, as much as that in the United States, which is increasingly now a multi-religious society. <coughs> Multi-religious societies, if they wish to remain liberal democracies, have to recognize that regardless of one's sectarian background, regardless of one's linguistic heritage, regardless of one's ethnic background, one must be treated, at least in constitutional terms, as an equal citizen of the country. Once one starts departing from this principle, and here minorities too have to be alert to this, that they cannot constantly claim privileges that are distinctive to them. If you wish to have a liberal democracy, individuals have to be treated as simply citizens of the country with certain rights and responsibilities, and not as ethnics, as we're having a, that your ethnicity is more important than your citizenship, or your religious identification is more important than your citizenship, or your uh, uh, sectarian identification is more important than your citizenship. And if one proceeds down that pathway, of privileging a particular group of people on the basis of ethnicity, on the basis of religion, on the basis of language, as has happened in many parts of the world, from Central Europe to Southeast Asia. I could list countries ad nauseum, which are electoral democracies, but they are quintessentially illiberal democracies. They are illiberal democracies because they have cast a significant portion of their population beyond the pale of full citizenship. And at one time, it looked like India might be headed in that direction. But fortunately, I was proven wrong, and there were enough corrective mechanisms within the body politic to ensure that countervailing forces actually stopped that pernicious trend and brought back India to a more uh, uh, felicitous uh, position. The real danger then is again this temptation to simply say, well, we hold regular elections, they are free and fair, people are allowed to vote. Yes, but that only assures you a certain standard of democracy. You do not meet the standard of liberal democracy. And even if one does not believe in liberal democracy from a normative or a moral standpoint, for a country like India, given its diversity, which is greater than all of Europe put together, it is a recipe for social disorder. So even if one doesn't want to do it for moral reasons, one should do it for purely instrumental reasons. But here, both the moral and the instrumental neatly converge, and hence my passion about liberal democracy. Let me quickly conclude, because I think as a typical garrulous academic, and worse still as a Bengali academic, I have gone over the time that I was allotted. But here I am making a reference to ethnicity, but I can do that being Bengali. Uh, uh, others can't. I would take umbrage quickly. Um, why do I deem these four issues to be uh, really pivotal to India's future? I think it's uh, the first, the transformation of India's economy is pivotal to India's future, largely because one has to extend the benefits of economic growth much more widely. It's as simple as that. And to sustain economic growth so that those benefits can actually be distributed. 
Second, the, the, the shift away from this ideational preoccupation of Indian foreign policy is equally important because India will need to move with dexterity to respond to global changes. And simply making hoary statements about what kind of world order it would like to see without the necessary wherewithal to pull it off is a recipe for leading to an, a, a complete dead end for the country. And consequently, I think this much more pragmatic and muscular foreign policy that India has pursued is one I hope that it will continue to do in the foreseeable future. The silent revolution obviously matters because it's going to make Indian democracy much more representative. And then I need not say anything more about the question of secularism because I think I've demonstrated both reason and passion on this subject. And on that note, let me bring this to a close. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sumit, for that uh, very overarching presentation. Uh, obviously, you have to be out of India to be as optimistic as uh, you have turned out to be. But I assure you, if you begin to uh, live in Delhi, even if you lived in Lutyens, Delhi, and uh, was an often visitor to the Indian Parliament and all the facets of uh, a democratic polity, I hope your optimism uh, would endure uh, those, uh, those onslaughts. But I will not go into uh, some of the more uh, basic structural issues that you have raised at this stage, uh, but uh, I'm pleased to be able to invite uh, any questions or any comments, and after that we'll make uh, one or two remarks of what I feel. So the floor is open. Please. I dare to ask this very unfashionable question only because you are associated with the chair in the name of Rabindranath Tagore. Now, what you call rhetoric flourishes in India's foreign policy, actually they have something to do with Indian civilizational values. And these were, while Western leaders always thought of what their country should be like, Indian leaders of that generation thought what the universe should be like, what the world should be like. And many of those principles got embedded in our foreign policy, which were picked up by the practitioners of the time. I feel privileged to be sitting next to a person whose briefing on the non-aligned summit which was held in India is still ringing in my ears. And I am raising this issue only because this puts a constraint on in the limits. It limits our relationship with the United States. If India does not give up its civilizational principles, if it does not give a sense of morality, if it doesn't want to aspire to be a superpower, then there will be always a gap between the perception of India and perception of the United States, because the latter is based on something which we do not subscribe to, at least the earlier generation never subscribed to, if in this onrush of self-interest, pursuit of self-interest and material values, if India changes, then of course it is a glorious era of Indo-US relations which I see more and then request you to. Maybe one way of looking at it is that if comments on the first component, foreign policy could then perhaps be clubbed together, then we can move on. Please. Uh, anyone wanting to say anything on foreign policy? Come, you can't keep quiet and not say anything on foreign policy. <laughs> so, please, I want to provoke you to say something. Well, I would uh, only like to say that, uh, in my view, uh, given the kind of uh, geopolitical uh, environment which India faced during the early years of its independence, uh, I regard non-alignment as a very appropriate policy uh, for that period. Uh, I think it is wrong to look at um, Mr. Nehru's uh, espousal of non-alignment as some kind of only moralistic uh, principle or a very universal principle. I think uh, Mr. Nehru, if you look at his writings and you look at some of his letters to the chief ministers, for example, uh, you will get a very clear sense that uh, there was, in fact, uh, a great deal of real politic in what he was he was trying to put across. 
so uh, I, I think that is important to understand. But I also concede that uh, as the world changed, <clears throat> and particularly the world uh, as it changed after 1990, uh, certainly um, even in terms of the principles which Mr. Nehru had put forward, uh, you had to make uh, a change. After all, uh, the Indo-Soviet partnership that is one talking about uh, is uh, uh, actually a legacy of the great exponent of non-alignment. And it was based on a very real politic uh, assessment of what are the challenges, strategic challenges which India uh, was facing during those 30 years from 1960 to 1990. And uh, post-1990, I think the wellsprings of Indian foreign policy still very much derive from that, uh, if, if, if I were to uh, articulate what the, what the objective of uh, Mr. Nehru's policy was, and which I think continues to inform a lot of the foreign policy making that we do today, is how do we expand India's uh, strategic space? How do we expand India's strategic autonomy? By that I mean, how do we make certain that in a world which is rapidly transforming, it is changing, a lot of challenges, uh, are there uh, at least to some extent possibility that India would be able to take uh, relatively autonomous decisions at least on those issues which bear directly on its vital national interests. Uh, and I think that the direction has been consistent uh, right since uh, India became uh, independent. Uh, certainly as practitioners, uh, we have uh, had to deal with uh, uh, foreign policy issues. Uh, we have not seen uh, actually a major departure uh, from those very basic principles in our, in our foreign policy. So uh, perhaps mark two of non-alignment, but still very much related to that major objective, which I uh, would have said was a major, major objective of Indian foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone this side? Yes, please. Mohan? Professor yeah. Gangli, how will you justify the success of Indian foreign policy the way we have relationship with our neighboring country like Pakistan, China, Sri Lanka, like that? Away from foreign policy, that's what I have since. Uh, or say, he's already provoked you by saying, gentleman sitting next to me is recalling your <laughs> very powerful briefing on non alignment. <laughs> Anyone uh, else? Would like to respond to that. Yeah. Let me start. Uh, let me start with the most uh, concrete uh, uh, Sorry. Uh, let me start with the most concrete question first, and then move to uh, questions of principle and uh, strategy. Principle, uh, sort of grand principles and strategy. In terms of relations with neighbours. Um, uh, uh, obviously, I think uh, uh, India might have uh, handled uh, relations with Bangladesh with, you know, uh, greater uh, uh, skill, but um, uh, or uh, with Sri Lanka for that matter. But on Pakistan, I'll take a very blunt view: the intransigence of the Pakistani state ever since uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, ever since the military coup of 1999 is just writ so large. And I'm speaking as a scholar, not as an Indian, uh, Indian nationalist. Uh, I'm writing an entire book on this subject. The evidence is so overwhelming. When you have a neighbor which is not only nurturing terror, but is promoting terror abroad, I mean, fr quite frankly, the Indian restraint is an interesting puzzle for students of foreign policy. How do you explain this extraordinary restraint in the face of incontrovertible evidence of the complicity of another state in using terror as an asymmetric weapon against you? And even then, you say, well, we should really continue talks. Uh, it completely defies everything I teach in my international th relations theory class. It's an interesting anomaly. And I'm not saying this is a joke. I, I really find this as a puzzle and as an anomaly because it does not conform to what one would expect, what theory would tell you. Uh, and as far as the other neighbors go, it's frankly, you know, it's partly the problem that the United States faces with Mexico. 
uh, that when you have an extraordinarily large power within a regional subsystem, choices that that power makes, which may seem callous, which may seem thoughtful from regional capitals, may not be seen that way in New Delhi. Uh, and there is often a kind of a perceptual gap. Now, could some of this be ameliorated? Obviously. Are there no tangible grievances? Probably yes. But I don't know of any state, either historically or in contemporary affairs, which is a dominant state in a region, which is genuinely loved by its smaller neighbors, particularly when the asymmetries are so extraordinary. So that would be my response. Um, um, in terms of uh, non-alignment, uh, Mr. Saran, you and I, I think, have less of a disagreement than what, what would appear. Obviously, in the context of a brief talk where only a quarter or a fifth was devoted to foreign policy, I was speaking in very telegraphic terms um, and very compressed terms. I do not, I am one of, uh, I will probably be an Eruvian till the point I alight my funeral pyre. Uh, I think his contributions are not fully recognized even today. One, I force my students to read The Discovery of India because I think it's one of the greatest tracts of political theory written in the 20th century. I mean, this is a man who says that Neville Chamberlain will not stand up to Hitler and he is sitting in Ahmednagar Fort Prison. How many global leaders of today can you name me who would have that kind of prescience? He says the degree of anti-Semitism that permeates Britain is so great that Chamberlain will not stand up to Hitler. Very few people are even aware that Nehru made this prediction. But it is, this is not an apocryphal story. I can even direct people to the passage where he writes this. And in fact, he said they made love to the fascists. That's the exact term he uses. Uh, so there is no gain saying his contributions. I am less sanguine about an individual that many of you served under, his daughter. I think she, in many ways, was more known for rhetoric and talked in Nehruvian language, but behaved in a very different fashion, both domestically and abroad. I am much more of a critic of hers. I have to be honest. If we have to part company on this issue, so be it. But I see her sins written much larger than most people even at someone at a great distance. Uh, I recall the manner in which she politicized the bureaucracy at home. I recall the, how she uh, shredded many institutions at home, um, how uh, uh, she made decisions in foreign policy largely on the basis of her personal um, uh, uh, vision rather than a careful uh, uh, attempt to construct the institutions within the August institution that you work for. Um, so I, I take a very different view of that period. And I saw India during that period become increasingly marginalized in the global order. India was known for making grand statements about the Charter of Rights and Duties of States in 1975. What did it accomplish at the end of the day? It left the third world even more marginalized. India supported the NIEO. India supported the quadrupling of uh, global oil prices with OPEC. And what consequences did it have for India? It is easy to dismiss material concerns when those of us who are already privileged can do so. I, material concerns matter a great deal to the poor. It's very difficult selling them civilizational values. Civilizational values mean very little to the poor. Uh, for the poor, uh, uh, bringing them a degree of material prosperity, which India is now in a position to do so, because of critical choices, both in foreign policy and economics, I think is much more important. And on this, I may have to part company with, with, with some. So uh, while I don't disagree with you that Nehru's uh, uh, vision of a world order uh, shaped largely by multilateral institutions and avoidance of the use of force to uh, deal with the international conflicts is very successful uh, promotion of India in peacekeeping operations, which many people have forgotten that UNEF 
the United Nations Emergency Force in Gaza had the largest Indian con contingent with an Indian general, Major General Inderjit Rikki, going back to the Congo, again, where India played an exemplary role. So those cannot be denied. It's just the period after my demigod is gone that I have severe reservations and I believe it, many of the choices made marginalized India. Uh, and I don't blame those of you who had to, to carry out the choices. I blame the political class for the choices they made. A good bureaucrat follows, uh, you know, uh, a good civil servant uh, follows the instructions that come from above. Thank you uh, uh, for that response. Can we club now uh, your part two and part three on the economic policy uh, framework and the mobilization of the poor. Although there are two distinct kind of themes, I think that there is a degree of symbiotic linkage which I can see. So, any questions or responses on that, please? Am I right in saying that the world hasn't had a model of the roads harnessed with ecological sustainability so far? I uh, some people in India are recommending giving up the growth model and more so recently because they think also about the, what do you recommend for India's future. Any more comments on any of the yes please. Hello. Yes, my name is Gerardo La Paulera. I'm living in New Delhi for two years and a half. Uh, since you mentioned Nero, and I want to, I'm in my Nero, Nero's period, so I'm reading the discovery of India and, and, and the speeches, etc. And, and, and one of the paradox when one lives in India is that one observes that uh, in the streets and in the society, a lack of conscience about what is called a public good. You know? I mean, the sense is a little bit around the question of uh, the first question. I mean, you know, all what is private is very clean and all what is public is dirty, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, uh, in, in, in the sense that... Uh, and so I think Nehru would not be very happy because this paradoxical Nehru was a person who imports socialism when you talk about the liberal democracies. And uh, so my, my sense is that this absence of conscience for the public good, even you have it in, in urban planning. You, you, you read the newspapers and you see those developers develop in totally autonomous cities, maybe because there is a, 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 fut a futilism or you know, there is a kind of a pessimism. It's so difficult, in some sense, to solve the problem of these 1.2 billion people that then we're going to have some partial solutions in order to deal with that. But what, what really strikes me as, as a foreigner in India is this uh, absence of the conscience for the, for the public good which I think is fundamental for a liberal democracy. Why is fundamental? Because it's fundamental in order to not widen the, 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 the problems of income disparities, first point. No? And uh, the second point is because, imagine, if you already have this ecological problem, you had it at the indoor rate of growth. Imagine when you continue with this, if you don't have a change in, in policies about the, the, the importance of the public goods and the, 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 the ecological issues, you know, you, you go towards a disaster. So I want to see your, your, your I would say, what are your thoughts about this? Please. Yeah. Uh, on, let me start, well, but the two questions are really closely related, so I'll try and club them together and, and uh, try and do justice at the same time. I agree with you about the lack of consciousness about the importance of public goods. Um, that is a very serious problem. Um, the fascinating thing is that it's not that it's not unrecognized. You talk to any Indian public intellectual, he or she will tell you this is one of the greatest shortcomings of Indian society. Yet uh, mobilization to do anything about it is very partial, is very sporadic, um, and it's uh, local for the most part. There is no sort of national consciousness about how to deal with public spaces and with 
uh, access uh, to public, uh, of ensuring access uh, to public goods, um, and um, uh, also thereby avoiding the tragedy of the commons. It's a pity that one of my colleagues is not here from my own department because she just won the Nobel Prize in Economic Science. And all of her work focuses on how to solve this problem of the public domain uh, without using highly centralized governmental power or by simply saying the market will deal with it and the market will absorb social costs, which it doesn't most of the time. Um, uh, except in the minds of certain ideologues, um, and they're always proven wrong, but you know, they're also impervious to knowledge. Um, the, uh, uh, there is no, uh, I have no simple panacea to the question that you're asking. All I, I can suggest is that there has been a phenomenal growth in terms of Indian civil society in the last decade or so, um, there is a, a growing understanding of the dangers that this kind of callousness uh, poses uh, for the country, and one hopes that it will gather sufficient momentum over time. The other thing is that if one looks at it in historical perspective, one should recognize, and this is not an apocryphal story, during the Industrial Revolution in Britain, the butterflies in certain parts of Britain, because of the presence of coal dust in the air, changed color. So it's, these are not irreversible processes. I mean, that does not, shouldn't make one completely sanguine about the future and say, well, you know, Britain's turned out quite nicely. It's sort of much like William Blake's green and pleasant land. Uh, well, on the one hand, you have Blake's green and pleasant land, and then you have uh, Charles Dickens writing about the dark, satanic mills of Coketown in a novel called Hard Times, uh, where he describes the horror of the Industrial Revolution. And it's fortunate that Britain developed enough public consciousness, and I'm choosing Britain largely because it was at one point the factory to the world, like China. Um, but I'm much less sanguine about China. I'm much more sanguine about India because democratic states, my silly optimism notwithstanding, um, have a capacity for self-correction. Britain passed legislation over time. Uh, the middle class increasingly became conscious of the kind of sport that was taking place. Um, that you were destroying, that there was a real problem of the tragedy of the commons. And one hopes that that kind of consciousness through public discourse in India will also uh, take hold. Perhaps not at a pace that I would like or you would like, but um, that's also the price of democracy. Uh, it's a long-winded answer to your question. To, oh, and you asked about a model. Uh, there is no universal model. They exist, but those are, those are not scalable. One can think of Sweden or Norway, which have done you know, extraordinary industrial growth, highly sophisticated societies, great deal of uh, reduction of inequality, and at the same time an extraordinary concern for uh, the environment. But uh, scaling these things up to a, a behemoth civilization like India um, uh, uh, uncritically is impossible. But that doesn't mean that one can't distill certain propositions certain lessons that can be gleaned and applied in smaller settings within India. Uh, so I think there are models available. The question is, how do you then account, uh, sort of adjust for scale? Because everything in India is, by, uh, sort of, uh, is uh, uh, magnified to such a great extent. Um, I think that's the, the process of taking that on is well underway. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, anyone wanting to ask him any question on the future of secularism, on which again he has been uh, optimistic at the end, please. Uh, I've seen that from India on the right. Uh, it's been industry, leadership in industry. I worry very much for the leadership of India. While Nehru was an architect, he was not an engineer to do anything practical. I admire his architecture. That's India. Came Mrs. Gandhi, I, you've already done enough. 
and won't go worse. The leaders after that and our prime ministers with our democratic Article 74 cabinet control in the last seven years. Security of India with Adam Smith is the first duty of the sovereign. I don't know how we will handle it. Do you think the leadership of India is one of the reasons we will go up or down? Well, yes. <laughs> Please, gentlemen, front. Thank you. Comme Carpentier, we bring out the journal World Affairs. Uh, I want to refer to secularism and the critique you made of India uh, because you seem to indicate that Western societies, by providing equality, irrespective of religious <coughs> affiliation, uh, have succeeded in something that India hasn't, hasn't succeeded in doing yet. However, if you look at secularism, do you agree with the fact that such things as personal law for Muslims <laughs> has kept the country, uh, by and large, socially and religiously stable, as opposed to certain Western societies in Europe and in America, which are turning out to be very unsuccessful in integrating their Muslim and other minorities. Let's face it, we are still not reconciled in the West to, for example, polytheism. We think that as long as you are a monotheist, maybe not a Muslim, but a monotheist, that's fine. But what if you are a polytheist? Well, that's not really serious. You know, you <laughs> so, I mean, let's face it, India has much greater maturity in this field. And I can refer to Professor R.P. Singh's recent statement that India should certainly not copy Western secularism, which may be failing, but rather has already devised, with all its imperfection, its own model, which allows uh, essentially to counteract what people like Iqbal said. And Iqbal was a spiritual father. And I'd like to reiterate that point again, um, that uh, I wasn't suggesting a kind of blind emulation of the Western model. I'm, I, I spend a good deal of time in France and uh, uh, deal with a number of French uh, intellectuals and scholars, and they're acutely aware of the difficulties that France is now confronting, um, or for that matter, even Germany, as the population becomes more diverse, particularly religiously, with large numbers of immigrants. And the, uh, their ability to now cope uh, with this kind of religious and ethnic diversity is really testing uh, the models that they had adopted. Britain, with multiculturalism, hasn't done much better either. So I'm not suggesting that there is a uh, model that can be happily imported. The United States, I thought, was a remarkably good uh, 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 model of secularism until after 9-11. I think, uh, uh, in many ways, the model of secularism in the United States is under stress, uh, largely because unscrupulous and short-sighted and parochial politicians have fanned fears uh, for rather short-term political ends. Uh, I think there were some genuine fears because this is the first time the United States was, at the soil of the United States was attacked until from since the 19th century. And consequently, there was a genuine sense of anxiety. But many of those anxieties were fanned, and very deliberately fanned, for very narrow electoral exigencies. Um, but subsequent to that, I think even the American model is under some duress at this point. I think it'll, the pendulum will swing back. So, so much for my, that I don't have an uncritical view of Western secularism. Um, and I also recognize that this has been a process that has taken several hundred years, and India is trying to sort of telescope history. That said, um, uh, the Indian model is a kind of a peculiar am amalgam. Uh, on the one hand, it, does re uh, is, it is a model of liberal democracy, but it makes certain concessions. But the question is, and this is, I have no clear-cut answer to this, the problem is, at what point you have to balance concessions with the commitment to liberalism. If you go back and read the constitutional debates, which I have, Prime Minister Nehru said at the time of the forging of the constitution and when the demands for a uniform civil code uh, were presented, he said, look, the Muslims have gone through a particularly traumatic time and we have to give them time to adjust to become uh, uh, secure within the Indian nation. Now, the danger 
of, of uh, this argument of extending it indefinitely, and I don't mean for Muslims, I mean for any community, special privileges, and if these special privileges keep mounting, and especially when they contravene certain basic liberal principles, then you have a real issue. And the United States on occasion has ruled against certain kinds of religious practices. The Supreme Court has said, no, you simply cannot claim that this is protected by religion because it violates other principles. So there is no uh, simple silver bullet that could be administered to deal with this problem. Um, this is something that is the subject of constant political negotiation and compromise, and one hopes not st uh, street violence uh, and pogroms um, against minorities, uh, but uh, a, a subject that both minorities and majorities will have to negotiate uh, and find uh, some form of accommodation. And I think India's uh, democratic system provides for all its flaws, provides that space. Uh, but I completely agree with you. The bottom line is that this is not a, uh, that India cannot uncritically adopt a model that worked with some efficacy uh, in Western Europe or in the United States. Because the organic pathway of the development of Indian secularism was very different. The historical pathway was very different. The circumstances were very different. Um, that's not a perfect answer, but that's the best I can master. Um, to your question about national security. Um, uh, debates about national security and the appropriate response uh, is something that vexes most major states. Uh, the United States currently is engaged in a major debate uh, of cutting the budget, of withdrawing from two highly, increasingly unpopular wars at home, let alone abroad. Um, and obviously there are important gaps in India's national security, but um, uh, there are also efforts to plug those gaps. Um, uh, and uh, uh, the, there is an un unevenness to this. The recent report of the Com uh, Comptroller and Accountant General of India about coastal security is deeply disturbing. After the events of 2611 and the extraordinary uh, uh, public uh, awareness of the, and elite awareness of the vulnerabilities of the Indian state. It is shocking that more, that more efforts have not been undertaken to secure India's very vulnerable coasts. Uh, but again, the mere fact that this had entered the public domain and the Comptroller and uh, Accountant General of India's report is so scathing, it goes back to my central point, that democracies have these corrective mechanisms. Unlike in China, you don't go out and shoot the guy who was responsible for coastal security. And as Amartya Sen likes to quote a particularly important statistic, and which is particularly relevant this week, given the mercy pleas before, uh, 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 before uh, the President of India again, uh, um, the, he points out that China executes more people within a, a year that in the India has done since 1947. I think it might have something to do with this very imperfect democracy. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sumit. Uh, we are coming to the close of uh, a very interesting and interactive session. Uh, I do not wish to sum up uh, what you have said. I hope you are right. Uh, in really ending up on this optimistic note. I hope that our current problems of governance and leadership are uh, cyclical and transitional. I hope that uh, your faith on the mobilization of the poor as they move upward is not based upon the continuation and the perpetuation of special privileges uh, because that is something which is an overarching phenomena. I hope that uh, the crossover from moving India moving away from identity-based politics to a politics which becomes increasingly more development-centric, which has been demonstrated in some states, becomes the order of the day. I hope that the current movement downwards on the economic growth trajectory 
is a passing phase and that the more difficult decisions which the acceptance of the daunting targets of the 25 year plan and the policy matrices which it involves will have a wide enough national consensus uh, across the political spectrum and that I hope at the end the areas of both Indian secularism, mobilization and economic policy which you believe uh, began from 1991 in a significant way and uh, is a continuation of a model to catapult India into a major economic and political power in the 21st century. In that sanguine belief, I end this conclusion wishing you all the luck in your belief.